Hey guys and welcome to this video. Today I will implement the vision transformer which was introduced in the paper an image is worth 16 times 16 words transformers for image recognition at scale. What you see on the screen is the official GitHub repository for this paper. However, since I know basically nothing about JAX, I will use a different repository that has a PyTorch implementation. This repository is called PyTorch Image Models, and it is also available on PyPI under the name Tim with double M. You can also see their documentation to learn more about it. Anyway, the reason why I decided to use their implementation is that they have pre-trained weights. Note that there are other amazing implementations on GitHub, and I will link them in the description. What I will do in this video is that I will just rewrite the following class called Vision Transformer from scratch. To verify that my implementation is correct, I will use the official implementation that you can see here together with pre-trained weights. Before I start though, let me point out that I will more or less just copy paste this implementation and add a couple of minor modifications, simplifications here and there. All the credit for the implementation goes to the authors and the contributors of this amazing library. So before we start, let me give you a quick overview of the architecture. First of all, the vision transformer is an image classifier. That means that it takes in an image and then it outputs a class prediction. However, the reason why it is special is that it does so without any convolutional layers. Instead, it uses the attention layers that are prevalent in the natural language processing applications. So the main question is, how can one turn an image to a sequence of one dimensional tokens so that we can use the transform architecture? Well, the idea is to split the input image into patches flatten these patches into one dimensional vectors, and then just use a linear mapping to create the initial embedding for each of the patches. And honestly, this diagram actually explains the entire idea amazingly well. Know that the transformers encoder shown on the right is virtually identical to the one proposed in the attention is all you need paper. Also, let me stress that similarly to BERT, we prepend the sequence with a so-called class token, and its goal is to capture the meaning of the the entire image as a whole. And it is exactly the final class tokens embedding after the last transformer block that we are going to be using for classification. And finally, we will learn a position embedding that will allow the network to determine what part of the image a specific patch came from. Again, this exact idea was already used in BERT. All right, so let us start with the implementation. We will start with arguably the most important module, and that is the patch embedding. All right, we will give this module an image size, and we are kind of implicitly assuming that it's a square. However, in general, it doesn't have to be. Similarly, we provide the patch size, and again, we assume that it's a square. So both the height and width are equal. This represents the number of channels of the image. For example, if you have a grayscale image, it will be equal to one. However, if we have an RGB image, it will be equal to three. And finally, we have the embedding dimension and it will determine how big an embedding of our patch is going to be. And note that this embedding dimension is going to stay constant across the entire network. Internally, we will have two attributes. One of them will be number of patches, representing the number of patches we split our image into. The second attribute is going to be a convolutional layer, and we will use it to split the image into patches. I know what you're thinking. I said that there wouldn't be any convolutional layers inside of our architecture. However, this one is not your regular convolution. Uh, I'll explain in a couple of moments. I save some of the parameters as attributes and then I compute the number of patches and in the actual model that I'm going to show you, the image size will be perfectly divisible by the patch size, so we will be covering the entire image. The 
Finally, we define the attribute projection. You probably noticed that it looks very suspicious if we look at the kernel size and the stride compared to, let's say, regular convolutional neural networks. So what we are doing here is that we take the kernel size and we take the stride and we put both of them equal to the patch size. This way, when we're sliding the kernel along the input tensor, we'll never slide it in an overlapping way. And the kernel will exactly fall into these patches that we're trying to divide our image into. The input tensor is nothing else than a batch of images. Know that number of samples and batch size are synonymous and I will be using number of samples across the entire tutorial. Also, since we are using PyTorch, the channels are actually the second or in Python terms, the first dimension. Finally, image size is the height and the width of our images and it's the number that we declared in the constructor. What we will get as an output is a three dimensional tensor and the second dimension represents different patches that we divide the image into and the last dimension will be the embedding dimension. We run the input tensor through the convolutional layer and we will get a four dimensional tensor. And we take the last two dimensions that represent the grid of patches and we flatten them into a single dimension. And finally, we swap two dimensions. And arguably at this point, we implemented all the novelty of this paper and what comes next can be more or less copied from NLP applications. Now we wanna write the attention module. All right, we provide the embedding dimension and know that we will set things up in a way that our input dimension of the tokens is going to be equal to the output dimension. Number of heads is another hyperparameter related to the attention mechanism. This parameter will determine whether we want to include a bias in our linear projections of the keys, queries, and values. And finally, we have two different dropout probabilities. Know that in this video, I will only run the network in an inference mode, so there is no need for a dropout. However, it gets really important during training because it fights overfitting. All right, let me give you a little bit more insight on the dropout layer. So as you can see by default, the dropout module is going to be set to the training mode. Each forward pass will remove approximately 50% of the elements and set them equal to zero. However, to make up for this removal, it will multiply the remaining elements with the following constant which in our case is two. Let us now set the module to the evaluation mode. We see that internally this training boolean got set to false. And as you can see in the evaluation mode, the dropout layer behaves exactly like an identity mapping. Internally, we save a scale factor and it will be used to normalize the dot product. We will have a linear mapping that can be actually split up into three separate ones, one for the keys, one for the values, and one for the queries. The projection is another linear layer and it is the last step of the attention mechanism. And finally, we have dropout layers. Here we define the dimensionality for each of the heads. The reason why we set it up in this way is that once we concatenate all the attention heads, we will get a new tensor that will have the same dimensionality as the input. This scale is coming from the attention is all you need paper. And the idea behind it is not to feed extremely large values into the softmax, which could lead into small gradients. Here we create a linear mapping that is going to take in a token embedding and generate a query, key, and a value. Note that you could also write three separate linear mappings that are more or less doing the same thing.
Here we define two dropout layers and we create a linear mapping that takes the concatenated heads and maps them into a new space. What's really important about the forward pass is that the input and the output tensors are going to have the same shape. Note that the second dimension is going to have a size of number of patches plus one. And the reason why I include the plus one is that we will always have the class token as the first token in the sequence. Here we just check whether the embedding dimension of the input tensor is the same as the one we declared in the constructor. Note that I could be probably writing way more of these sanity checks. However, yeah, I just decided that this one is kind of important. Here we take the input tensor and we turn it into the queries, keys, and values. Before I continue, I will take a small sidestep and explain how the linear layer behaves when we have three dimensional or more dimensional tensors. The most common way how to use the linear layer is to give it a two-dimensional input. The first dimension represents the samples or the batch, and the second one is equal to the input features we declared in the constructor. And as you can see, for each sample, the linear layer simply took the input features and mapped them into the output features. However, you can use the linear layer on tensors of arbitrary dimension higher than two as well. And in that case, the only thing you need to make sure of is that the input tensors last dimension is equal to the input features you declared in the constructor. As you can see, the output tensor was just created by applying the linear layer across all the samples and across the entire second dimension. Here I created a tensor with seven dimensions and not surprisingly, the behavior is going to stay the same. All right, so in our implementation, we actually applied the linear layer to a three dimensional tensor and this will be the final dimension. In the reshape step, we create an extra dimension for the heads, and also we create an extra dimension for the key query and value. And in the permute step, we change their order. Given the previous permutation, now it's very easy to extract the keys, values, and queries. Here we transpose our keys because we're getting ready to compute the dot product. We compute the dot product and we use the scale factor. Know that the matrix multiplication of the two respective tensors is going to work out because the last two dimensions are compatible. Here we apply a softmax over the last dimension. And the reason is that we want to create a discrete probability distribution that sums up to one and can be used as weights in a weighted average. We compute a weighted average of all the values. Here we just swap two dimensions. And I just realized that I forgot the attention dropout. And finally, we flatten the last two dimensions. In other words, the last two operations concatenated the attention heads. And note that we end up with a three-dimensional tensor that has exactly the dimensions that we want. Finally, we do the last linear projection and we follow it up by a dropout and we're done. All right, let us now implement the multi-layer perceptron.
This multi-layer perceptron is going to have one hidden layer and there's nothing special about it. Maybe one interesting thing is that we are going to be using the Gaussian error linear unit activation function. All right, we just simply instantiate all the layers Similarly to the attention block, we are going to be applying the linear mapping to a three-dimensional tensor. We apply the activation, then a dropout, then the second linear layer, and finally another dropout. Know that none of these operations are changing the shape of the tensor. All right, we have everything we need, and now it's time to start putting things together. We've seen most of these parameters before, however, this MLP ratio is a new one and it determines the hidden layer size of the multi-layer perceptron. When it comes to the attributes, we will have two normalization layers, one attention module and one multi-layer perceptron module. We instantiate the first layer normalization module and we set the epsilon equal to 10 to the power of minus 6. If you're wondering why, it's because we just want to match the pre-trained model. Anyway, let me now show you the basic properties of the layer norm. I create a tensor with three samples and two features, and I instantiate the layer norm. However, I set element-wise affine equal to false. This way, there will be no learnable parameters. Let us now compute the mean and the standard deviation for each sample of our input. The layer norm will use these to normalize the data, and it will do this for each sample. As you can see, the layer norm made sure that the mean and the standard deviation is 0 and 1 respectively for each sample. Let me just point out that this process is independent for different samples. In other words, the batch size doesn't really play any role. Let me now reinstantiate the module. However, this time I will set the element wise affine equal to true. And that is actually the default. As you can see, now we have four learnable parameters. They are actually contained in the bias and the weight parameter of the module. They represent the new per feature mean and standard deviation that will be used to rescale the data. If we run the forward pass, it seems like nothing changed if we compare it to the element wise affine equal to false. However, this time around, we actually did two things. First, we applied the normalization as before, and then we used our learnable parameters to rescale the data. The parameters are initialized in a way that make it seem as if the second step never happened. The parameters would get learned during training or for the purposes of this example, I can just manually change them. And as you can see, after updating the parameters, the forward pass returns different tensors. So now it's clear that the second rescaling step is actually taking place. Finally, let me just point out that our input tensor can have an arbitrary number of dimensions as long as the last dimension is equal to the number of features. However, the logic stays the same and it is always the last dimension that is being normalized. We're back in the implementation and we continue with the attention layer.
we define the absolute value of the hidden features and it's nothing else than the dimensionality times the MLP ratio. As you can see, the input features and output features are going to be the same number. So we probably could have simplified the multilayer perceptron class a little bit, but whatever. All right, this entire block has again the property that the input tensor and the output tensors are going to have the same shape. Here we create a residual block. So we take the original input tensor and we add to it a new tensor. And this new tensor is created by applying the layer norm and the attention. And the second tensor is created by applying the second layer normalization and the multi-layer perceptron. Know that we are using two separate layer normalization modules and it's really important because both of them will have their separate parameters. All right, and now we're finally ready to put everything together and write the vision transformer. All right, we've seen most of these parameters before. One that's new is the depth and it will represent the number of transformer blocks. We'll instantiate the patch embedding as the very first layer of our network. And then we will have two parameters. The first one is the class token, and it will represent the first token in the sequence, and it will be always prepended to the patch embeddings. The second parameter is going to be the positional embedding, and we include it to encode the information about where exactly that given patch is located in the image. We also create a module list that will hold all the block modules. Patch embedding is going to be the very first layer. We define the class token parameter and we initialize it with zeros. Know that the first two dimensions are there just for convenience. We add the positional embedding parameter and its goal is to determine where exactly a given patch is in the image. We also want to learn the positional encoding for the class token and that's why there is the plus one. And again, the first dimension is there just for convenience. Here we iteratively create the transformer encoder. Know that the hyperparameters of each block are the same. However, each of the blocks will have its own learnable parameters. We add a normalization layer and we also create a linear mapping that is going to input the final embedding of the class token and output logits over all the classes. All right, let us now write the forward pass. The input tensor is nothing else than a batch of images. And the output tensor will represent the logits for each sample. We take our input images and we turn them into patch embeddings. We take the learnable class token and we just replicate it over the sample dimension. And then we just take it and prepend it to the patch embeddings. Then we add the positional embeddings that we learned. Know that PyTorch will take care of the broadcasting. We apply a dropout. And here we iteratively define all the blocks of our transform encoder. We apply layer normalization. Out of all the patch embeddings that we have, we only select the class embedding. 
And it is exactly this embedding that continues to the classifier. So in a way, we're hoping that this embedding encodes the meaning of the entire image because we threw away all the other patch embeddings. And at this point, we're done. Let us now write a script that will verify that our implementation is correct. This helper function will count the number of learnable parameters. Here we take two tensors and we compare whether they are equal. Here we take the temp package that corresponds to the GitHub repository I described at the beginning of the video, and we load one of the pre-trained vision transformer models. Here I define the hyperparameters that are corresponding to the pre-trained model. We instantiate our custom model that we just implemented and we set it to the evaluation mode. Here we iterate through all the parameters of the official network and our custom network. First of all, for each parameter, we check whether the number of elements is equal. Note that we are making an assumption that the order in which the modules were instantiated in the constructor is the same for the official and the custom model. However, I made sure it is the case. We just take our custom parameter and we redefine it to be equal to the parameter of the official implementation. Here we just double check that the assignment worked. Here we create a random tensor that has the right shape that our networks are expecting. And then we just run the forward pass both for the custom network and for the official one. First of all, we check whether the number of trainable parameters is the same for both of the networks. And then we take the two output tensors and make sure they are identical. And finally, if we make it through all the checks, we just save our model that contains the correct weights. Let me first show you the version of Tim I'm using. First of all, it downloads the checkpoint. All right, so the script was run and there was no assertion error. And as you can see, we have the model path checkpoint lying in our working directory. Let me reiterate, the only reason why this worked was that I was very careful about when and where exactly I define each of these layers in the module constructors. One way to break this is to just swap the order. So here, for example, I will just swap the class token and position embedding. As you can see, we're getting an assertion error, which means that one of the checks failed. All right, and now the only thing left to do is to run the forward pass on a real image instead of a random tensor. And because I don't want you to feel like I clickbaited you, we will use the cat in the thumbnail. As you can see, it has exactly the right dimensions that we need. Also, I have this text file that contains all the ImageNet classes. All right, so I loaded the classes, I loaded the model, and I also loaded the image and pre-processed it. We run the forward pass and we turned the logits into probabilities. And it seems like the model is making the right predictions. Anyway, that's it for the video. I hope you found it interesting. And I also hope I did not butcher the original implementation too much. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, all the credit goes to the authors and the contributors of the Tim library. And I more than encourage you to check it out and give it a try. Please let me know in the comments what you liked and what you didn't like. 
Also, if you have any suggestions for future topics, I would be more than happy to hear them. Currently, I'm just trying out different things and then using YouTube statistics to guess what interests you and what doesn't. So again, do not hesitate to directly share your feedback. I would more than appreciate it. Anyway, have a nice day and see you next time.